I got saved in a little church in West Stewartstown, New Hampshire. Anyone here in West Stewartstown? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's where God lives. Yeah. <laughs> but there's another, uh, we got saved in a little church with about 15 people, and uh, three of us young bucks got saved. Well, they were actually saved before I was. We all went off the Bible school. One of them's name is Phil Burns. Everybody, anyone here ever hear of Phil Burns? He's the pastor of Grove Street Baptist. Uh, was a missionary in the Philippines for a long time, and uh, got to, he contacted the church where I used to pastor and said uh, he'd like to get a hold of me, so we, we talked on the phone. He's retiring pretty soon, probably, he's thinking. I don't know if I should have said that on a few years ago. <laughs> I don't remember if he should keep that quiet or not. So, <laughs> no, I should have said that. <laughs> It's hard not to get in trouble when you're on a place like this. But uh, he's, uh, the Lord's really moved him in an area. And he said, Jeff, the thing, I, I've been around visiting churches. And the thing that's lacking in the New England area, in his opinion, is prayer. And I got thinking about that. I've been here now six, eight weeks, maybe more than that. Uh, and we don't pray enough, do we? We really don't. And I'm guilty of that. I'm not going to point the finger at anybody else but me. Because uh, where as the leader goes, they go to church sooner or later, right? So let's just take a minute. And uh, number one, uh, prayer requests. Not necessarily your sore toe, because we all have sore toes. But the uh, things... And if you have a real sore toe, we want to pray about this. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying, don't you? There's stuff that's really more important than a sore toe. We've got this women's uh, day coming up. Okay, women's retreat. And uh, Carol, we're going to be privileged to have Carol as our speaker. That's right, the internationally known famous speaker coming. <laughs> I agree. And then I have one unspoken. Yeah. Debbie unspoken. Absolutely. That's right. More than their physical health, their spiritual health, right? The fact that they would uh, be brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and, and get, get saved. Absolutely. Patty. Yeah,
praise them also. Um, got your visit us this week. Yeah. Is she back already? She went back yesterday to oh. Veronica. And, um, okay, a little better weather yesterday than the last trip. Huh? Yeah, yeah, a lot better. Yeah. yeah. Um, this week, her, the band that she is in, is going around to different churches and schools to um, share the message of Jesus and also talk about the Word of life. Yeah, pretty, let's pray. Uh, the tragedies that are going on in the world, all these shootings and everything, just crazy. How huh? that the two two lost twenty or forty nine people, some crazy thing. And much as we don't agree with the theology, we don't want to. We, and maybe gives maybe Christian people in that land an opportunity to to share a little, a little bit of the hope we have in Christ. Let's pray together, okay? Whoa, Rusty. Just have a, a praise and a prayer request. We're just really thankful as we've transitioned this year that God has just enabled us to do that in strength. And I'm you know, looking at the crowd this morning and just really thankful that we're growing and uh, that God is doing work here. But just want to continue to pray that God would really grow us. We want to be effective inside of these four walls, but we want to grow in our effectiveness outside these four walls. So that's right. Yeah. In fact, would you pray about summer ministry? Because uh, we got Mike coming uh, May 11th and. Uh, He's, he's got the date right down and everything. <laughs> he's excited, and uh, your daughter's excited as well. And uh, we're going to see what God's going to do with anybody else that may be interested in doing ministry. We're going to work with Mark Solmason. I talked to Dick Burley. He wants to get involved in it a little bit. Oh, Melissa, uh, uh, Rachel Officer, CEF, she's, uh, she's going to be here with us, by the way, just to present her ministry, just uh, what she's up to. The Sunday after Mother's Day, I think it's the 19th or something like that, of May. She's just going to come and she's the new kid on the block with CPF, and they're going to be doing summer ministry with kids, child evangelism groups. So just pray for that. Let's. No one? Okay. Oh, Lizzie. Uh, no, Lizzie. <laughs> Victoria. Rachel and I are putting on a conference on the 29th, the girls' conference in London. Cool. All right. Jeff, I don't really have all the details down on this, and that's okay. Um, but I know because of a car accident, there's been a mom that's been driving the car, lost her 18-month-old baby, and uh, she was in the hospital. I don't know if something has changed from that status or not, but if anybody can give an update to me, I, I don't dare speak more than that. Yeah, Patty. yeah that's um, my friend's husband just died. Um, that's her daughter's friend who lost the baby. They were actually traveling the funeral. Um, my friend's know. husband? Say that again. It's a, it's a friend of a friend of ours. And um, they were coming, they were on their way to come to this funeral. So I'm not sure.
Driving. They've been on my heart. Driving. Yeah. Absolutely. He's 11 years old. <coughs> Lizzie, now I got you. Lizzie, this thing. <laughs> you have a friend with cancer? Okay. All right. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you're a God that uh, can hear a million people at once, or a billion. You know, we, we think of you as a superman sometimes. We think of humans with two ears and think, how can God hear all the people praying at once? But Lord, you're not a human. You're omnipresent and omnipotent and omniscient and all the omni words and all the things we try to say that we'll never understand you, we'll never fathom all there is to know about you, but we know that you care for us. And you really, really demonstrated that at the cross. And you told us to pray. You gave us illustrations of the woman that just persistently kept talking to the king, talking to the king, talking to the king, and the king finally said, okay, okay, I'll do it. Uh, Lord, you want us to pray. And I pray right now. I pray for this ladies' retreat that's coming up on the 30th. And I pray you'll just give Carol peace as she prepares. And, and bring in some unsaved ladies. Lord, uh, that this could be an outreach opportunity. Uh, same with uh, Tori and Rachel as they get ready to, to do this one with the girls on the 29th. And just pray. Again, outreach and encouragement and encouraging young ladies to just live the faith and stay pure and, and be what we're supposed to be. And uh, not just sing it, but bring it, like we talked about last week. For John and Ruby's kids, all of us, Lord, I think most of us have kids that we would pray they might be in a different spot than they're at. And I just pray you help us as the parents of them and grandparents of them to, to uh, live it ourselves, try to be an example, try to encourage them. I pray for these grandkids. Like Carol Whale was saying, uh, we want to pray for our grandchildren. For Bob and Patty, as they try to minister this next couple of days to this hurting family, uh, just give them words. Give them grace, compassion. They, they are just, just helping to reach out to them and do the best they can. For Debbie, with the, the unspoken request she has, I know there's people here in the group this side that are hurting badly, so they don't even want to talk about it probably. But I pray that your word will meet the needs of their heart. And uh, that we as a body can minister to the needs of each other. That we can, people can walk in here and feel like they're accepted. Regardless of where they come from. We're all, the ground is level at the cross. We're grateful for that. Help us to uh, remember where we came from, some of us, and, and also where we still are, a lot of us. We're works in progress. Thank you that Melissa Lacey made you back safe. Pray, Lord, you just open up hearts for the rest of this time we have together in the Word. We commit our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We're going to start now. I'm just going to preach through the book of Romans. I've been doing a lot of topical sermons up to this time. I was thinking that uh, when we came to that last song, and uh, in about 15 seconds time, someone was able to realize, okay, we're singing a song and the lyrics aren't on there, and in about 15 seconds, bing, 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 all of a sudden the lyrics are up there. Doesn't that blow your mind? It blows mine. There isn't much to blow it with. <laughs> Someone said a thought popped into my mind. They said there's plenty of room for it to land in there. <laughs> Romans 1 is a, this book, Romans, is a legal document almost. And when I went to seminary 40 plus years ago, I had a Bible teacher who was at the time 75, and his boy was the um, Attorney General of the state of Pennsylvania. And Clayton Howard Gray was his name, and he was, he preached like a, I mean, he was an orator, you know what I mean, the old-fashioned tie and suit coat and everything just right, and the doctrine of the Word of God, I mean, he preached, you know, it was uh, the, the old-fashioned type preaching, but like he said that, the, and according to his son, when his son went to law school back then, probably, I don't know how long ago, Romans 
evidence was used as a document to study for someone to prove a case in court. That's, that's what this book really is. Okay? You think of all the other epistles. All the other epistles, uh, Paul had been to all these places, and he rubbed elbows with them and talked with them, and then they, maybe he heard back they were having problems with this and problems with that. And all the little epistles, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, all of them, First and Second Timothy, Titus, all, all the New Testament little epistles are all really basically addressing issues in churches. Okay? Paul never got to Rome. And he always wanted to go there. Um, let's start by reading a few verses. Paul, chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. You want someone to vindicate your ministry? After you're dead, come alive again, okay? People better listen, huh? Isn't that cool? We'll be celebrating that real quick. Don't you love this time of year? Amen. I was telling Julie, uh, what, how do you pronounce your last name? Rays. Rays, I thought. Rays. Whatever it is. Anyway, I said, Julie, isn't it funny? This time of year, everybody's smile starts to get a little, a little brighter. You know, you see the sun shine out and it's starting to melt. You, sink in the mud, but everybody's a little more happy <laughs> because the end is near. Uh, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may know at last, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that... What's it say next to you? I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented. Now this, guys, isn't some spiritual... Crackpot. This is the Apostle Paul. This is the guy who prays over people and they get healed. But he said, I have often intended to come to you, but thus far I have been prevented. In order that I may reach some highest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles, I am under obligation both to Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome also. Only Christians have something. Uh, put it, let me rephrase that. Of all people in the world, think of some good causes you can take out to put your put your energy and your life's efforts into. Anyone seen any documentaries on the plastic that's in the ocean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty serious problem. Yeah. Okay. Could an unsafe person work on that issue? Absolutely. Yeah. What about our carbon footprint? <coughs> you heard of a carbon footprint? Every one of us is supposed to be trying to reduce our carbon footprint because of global warming. Can an unsafe person work on that issue? Think of some other issues, will you? Can you think of some that are 
hot topics that, you know, a lot of us, we hear about it in the news, things that are kind of serious. Homelessness. Homeless, the homeless issue. The opioid crisis. The opioid crisis. Could an unsafe person make some headway with the opioid crisis? Absolutely. Can, he, oh, can an unsafe, could unsafe people put together a, a homeless shelter? They do it pretty good in concrete. <laughs> uh, species extinction. Anyone here watch uh, Animal Planet? They say 30% of the species now on Earth will be extinct by 2030 or something, so they say. I think that's a little doomsday stuff, but I don't know, but, but do you think unsafe people can go over there and try to rescue the... How many here watch uh, Heartland? Did you ever watch Heartland? Yeah. Did Ty go... Ty went to Mongolia. Have you got that far yet? I don't want to ruin it for you. <laughs> Ty went to Mongolia to rescue some kind of a... What was it? A bear, right? Some kind of bear. <laughs> Ty, as far as I know, is unsafe, brother. <laughs> All right. Social justice, social injustice, clean water. Is that one? Okay. All those things unsafe people can do probably just as good or better than we can do. But what's one thing they can't do? Gospel. They can't lead anybody to Jesus Christ with the gospel because they don't know what it is. And Paul says... Right here, he is separated unto the gospel. It's uh, the word in the, in the ESV is set apart for the gospel. Paul didn't have any hobbies. Paul did make a tent when he had to. Okay, when he had when he had to, they weren't meeting his needs, and he had to eat. He had to have a place to stay. And several times in his missionary journey, he actually made some tents so he wasn't accountable and chargeable to anybody. But he just totally gave himself to the preaching of the gospel. One thing Paul didn't have was a wife. Because if you're married, you can't do that. Isn't that true? What's the same first Corinthians 7? He said, I would that you'd be like I am, but nevertheless, if you want to marry, go ahead and marry. But realize that when you do that, there's things you're going to have to do to please your wife, and vice versa, because that's just the way it is. So you can't totally give yourself 100% to preaching the gospel. And, and family, anyone here ever have children, have to get up in the middle of the night and, and change diapers, and all that stuff. Would you go with me to, uh, so that's Paul, who, who is Paul? I want to just take a couple minutes, go to Acts chapter 26. Just a couple pages back from where you are, one to one. I'm, I'm going to raise a couple questions, I'm, and I'm, I'm kind of flying all over the place, but hopefully you can put the puzzle pieces all together eventually. Ask yourself if you had an important mission, if you had something you wanted done, it was really, really important to you. Let's say like you had a, a large sum of money you wanted to live in some place. And you couldn't do it yourself. You had to hire somebody or ask somebody else to do it for you. If it was a huge, huge sum of money, do you think you'd go to the halfway house in Concord where people are just getting out of prison? and say to that individual, uh, you know, I got this job and I need someone of the utmost integrity to do this job for me. So uh, I'm wondering, would any of you guys like to volunteer to help me take this boatload of money somewhere? Follow what I'm saying? Okay. God's called somebody to be the, the preacher to the Gentiles, the preacher to the Gentiles. Who did he call? Chapter 26, Agrippa says to Paul, King Agrippa, uh, by this time, okay, now Paul has made it to Rome, okay, 
in this, but what he tells us about himself when he comes in front of King Agrippa. And I, Monday night, we uh, Tuesday night, the men's group read a little bit about King Agrippa, some stuff I never knew about King Agrippa. If I did, I forgot it. I may have read this in Bible school, but that was a long time ago. Who was this King Agrippa, first of all? King Agrippa II was the latest of the Herod dynasty, the last of the Herods to meddle with Christ or with his followers. His great-grandfather was the King Herod, who had feared the birth of the Christ child, and because of the fear of the Christ child, you remember what he did? King Herod, that King Herod, what he did? Put out the order to kill everybody two years old and young. Okay, that's, that's this guy's grandfather. All right? Uh, the grand uncle of Agrippa had, was the one who murdered John the Baptist. And his father, Agrippa I, had executed James and imprisoned Peter and was the guy who got eaten with worms as a punishment for allowing people to worship him as God, right in Caesarea, and that's in, uh, in Acts 12. Now this Agrippa II was uh, with this lady named Bernice. Guess who that was? His own full-blooded sister. Okay? Who was one year younger. She had once been engaged to a man named Marcus, who was a nephew of the philosopher Philo, the Jew. Then she married her uncle, King uh, Herod, king of Chalcis. But now she was living incestuously with her full-blooded brother Agrippa. So notorious was her conduct that when she later became the Emperor Titus's mistress, he had to send her away because of the moral outcry, even of pagan Rome. So this was so bad, even Rome wouldn't accept her. That's, but, but, um, Agrippa and Bernice were a sick, sin-infested couple. To make matters even more outrageous, Rome considered Agrippa an authority on the Jewish religion. He was a Herod. He was appointed curator of the temple. The curator of the temple was the man who appointed the high priest to administer the temple treasury. Okay? Uh, so he, he was really familiar. He's, he's in charge of trying to keep peace in Jerusalem and all throughout that area with the Jews doing what they're doing and now with Christians doing what they're doing and all the problems that are coming because of the preaching of the gospel, okay? So in that light, okay, Paul's in trouble because he's preaching the gospel. The Jews are hating him, trying to kill him, and he ends up appealing to Caesar and ends up going to Rome and when he gets it to Rome, Agrippa shows up. So before Agrippa, he's going to tell Agrippa the things kind of like that Agrippa already knows about him. So that's why we have, Agrippa says to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul stretches out his hand and makes his defense. And, and, and look, at this he's in, I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I'm going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Then he goes on to say, My manner of life from my youth spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem is known by all the Jews. They've known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to my fathers to which our twelve tribes hope to attain, as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope I am accused by Jews, O King. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? In other words, he's saying, listen, guys, in your, in your Old Testament scriptures, God talks about the resurrection. He talked about it in the book of Job, the oldest book ever written. In my flesh I shall see God. Right? And he says here in verse 9, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I did so. In Jerusalem, I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I sent dogs and tried to make them blaspheme. 
And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. So it's like God goes into the halfway house and finds one of the worst opponents of Christianity and takes him and saves his soul on the road to Damascus, which he would tell us here later on, and, and, and then all of a sudden turns him around, and he becomes the preacher to the Gentiles. But what, what is he? He's an example to anybody. I don't care how bad you've been. You can get sick. It doesn't make any difference what you've done. And Paul was a physical human example of someone that got his life turned around and brought and saved. Isn't that awesome? That yeah. God does things totally different than we do. It's just crazy. Now, uh, go back to Romans. It just Again, it's just a couple pages kind of handy. And if we got time for a little sidetrack that I think is going to bless you. Um, remember when I was going through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the four faces of the gospel that was a lion? and the uh, ox, and the man, and the eagle. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. And the, the lion was uh, Jesus Christ. It's presented as the lion of the tribe of Judah. It's in Matthew that he's, uh, he's presented as the lion of the tribe of Judah, as the, the perfect king to the Jews. And in Luke, who is the physical doctor, the physician, he presents him as the perfect, the son of man, the face of a man, the son of man. And in those two books are two genealogies. And I'll, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's, a, there's a gem in there that I want you to see. But let's, uh, Romans 1, first of all. Paul is a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, verse 3, who was descended from David according to the flesh. According to the flesh. So go back to uh, okay, you want to put that slide up now? Alright. Okay, we're going to talk about David a little bit. Just for a minute. The Davidic, one of the, the several covenants, there's the Abrahamic covenant, the Edenic covenant, the Adamic covenant, the uh, Abrahamic covenant, Palestinian covenant, all there's like at least seven covenants in the, in the Old Testament, but one of them is called the Davidic covenant, where he promises that the line of the tribe of Judah, he's promised to the tribe of Judah in Genesis 49. He's, it's David's promised kingdom, a political kingdom. David's house is going to be a dynasty, there's going to be a royal line. So when he talks here in Romans about concerning his son who was descended from David, there's a reason why he says he descended from David. Because in order for Jesus to be king, he has to be a physical descendant of David. You follow what I'm saying? This is all part of this. Uh, uh, he was also incised to Abraham. It was prophesied in, in advance in Genesis 38. Ruth. It was also confirmed by an oath in Psalm 132, Psalm 89, and etc. But, look at that last one. Solomon's sons failed. Can you see it, good enough? Yeah. Some of the sons failed. Jeconiah was the last of David's line to sit on the throne. Okay. Here's a, a little nugget for you. Why? Why was Jeconiah the last of David's line to sit on the throne? Go to um, Jeremiah, the, the Old Testament prophet, Jeremiah, chapter 36. I learned this in Bible school, and when I learned it, I just, I was just blown away. Did anybody find it yet in the Bible? The page number. The, oh, the page number in the. Yeah, if anybody finds it. It's just, it's just before Hezekiah. Five sixty four. Five sixty four. There is no Hezekiah. Thank you. Jeremiah twelve thirty six. Twelve thirty six. And you got one of the pew Bibles, yeah. 1236. 1236. 1236. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 36. Uh, again, just a minute, but I'll have you out here by 3 o'clock. Okay, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, aren't you glad you don't name your sons these names now? 
He's the son of Josiah, king of Judah. His, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Take a scroll and write on it all the words that I've spoken to you against Israel and Judah. Okay? At this time in Israel's history, they've gone way off the track and they're way away from God. So at this time, they're against. This is the end of the lines of the kings. All right? It, it started with David. Remember, it started with uh, actually Saul and David, then, then uh, Solomon, and then Solomon, then Rehoboam, and the king split and all that took place. But now we're at the end of this, where, where this has come out. Solomon's sons failed. Uh, against Israel and Judah and all the nations from the day I spoke to you, from the days of Josiah until today, verse 3, it may be that the house of Judah will hear all the disaster that I intend to do to them, so that everyone may turn from his evil way, and that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. So Jeremiah calls Baruch the son of Neriah, and Baruch, who was a scribe, wrote on a scroll, at the dictation of Jeremiah, all the words of the Lord that he had spoken to him, and Jeremiah ordered Baruch, saying, I'm banned from going to the house of the Lord, so you go. And on the day of fasting and hearing of all the people, the Lord's house used to read the words of the Lord from the scroll that you've written in my dictation. You'll read them also in the hearing of all the men of Judah who come out of their cities. And it may be that their plea for mercy will come before the Lord, and that everyone will turn from his evil way. For great is the anger and wrath that the Lord has pronounced against this people. Okay? So he goes in and he presents this to the people. Go back up down to verse uh, 17. We must report all these words to the king. So they asked Baruch, tell us please, how did you write all these words? Was it at his dictation? And Baruch answered them, he dictated all these words to me while I wrote them with ink on the scroll. And the official said to Baruch, go and hide you and Jeremiah and let no one know where you are. Because well, when the king hears this, he's going to be mad. He's going to come after you. Okay? These aren't good words. These are bad words. So they went into the court to the king. Having put the scroll in the chamber of Elisha the secretary, they reported all the words to the king. And the king sent Jehudi to get that scroll, and he took it from the chamber of Elisha the secretary. And Jehudi read it to the king and all the officials who stood beside the king. It was the ninth month. The king was sitting in the winter house, and there was a fire burning in the fire pot before him. And as Jehudi read, remember he says, maybe they'll listen and they'll repent and I won't have to do this. Look what happened. As Jehudi read three or four columns, the king cut them off with a knife and threw them into the fire in the fire pot. Until the entire scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the fire pot. Yet neither the king nor any of his servants who heard all these words were afraid. Nor did they tear their garments. Even when El Nathan and Deliah and Germariah urged the king not to burn the scroll, he would not listen to them. So basically what he said, this is what I think of that. That's what I think about this warning. I, you know, spits in God's face pretty much. Verse 27. Now after the king had burned the scroll with the words that Baruch wrote at Jeremiah's dictation, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, take another scroll and write on it all the former things that were in the first scroll. And go down to verse 30 just to speed things up a little. Therefore thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim king of Judah, He shall have none to sit on the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out to the heat by day and the frost by night, and I will punish him and his offspring and his servants for their iniquity. I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem and upon the people of Judah, all the disaster that I have pronounced against them, but they would not hear it. So he says, Baruch, take and copy this same message and take it to him a second time. But at the end of this, put a PS on it. By the way, there'll never be a king and from your loins ever sit on the throne of David again. So now we have a real problem. Go to Matthew. Chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. And I have in my Bible just circled some names just to help you out a little bit. Chapter 1, verse 2. What's the first name? Abraham. Abraham. You can circle Abraham if you believe in writing in your Bible. And if you don't, don't. <laughs> Go down to verse 6. 
And Jesse, the father of David, the king, and David, I circle David, was the father of Solomon. I circle Solomon. And you go down through to Rehoboam, Rehoboam, Abijah, etc., down through Uzziah, all those, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Manasseh, Amos, Amos, Josiah, Josiah, the father of Jeconiah. This is, this, this is the genealogy of who? Jesus Christ, who's going to be the king of Israel, presented to the Jews as the king of Israel. But look whose name is it. It's the man that was cursed. There will never be someone set on, his, on the throne that's a descendant of this man. Keep going down through. When you get down to verse uh, 15, Iliad, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Nathan, Nathan, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of who? Joseph. Joseph, Joseph the father of Christ? No. Joseph, the husband of Mary. Get it? If, if Joseph was the physical father of David, the curse of Jeconiah. Jesus couldn't be the king. You see? Did God know what he was doing? <laughs> I just it blows me away. Can you imagine a bunch of prophets? And when you okay. So you have here Joseph, the husband of Mary, so the bypass, but there's another problem. He has to also be the son of Abraham. So in order for a king to be king, he has to have a royal lineage which Joseph became his royal lineage heir because he adopted him legally. So he's the legal, he has the legal right to the throne through Joseph. Go over to Luke. And here's where it's the son of man now. Luke was the one who possessed the, the doctor issue. And go to chapter 4. Excuse me, chapter 3. In order for Jesus to be a king and set on the throne, he has to have royal blood. He has to have royal blood. So uh, verse 23, Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son as was supposed of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Matthat, and he goes down through all those names, and you can't even pronounce them, never mind reading them. But all of a sudden, you're going to see, why does God have genealogies like this in the Bible? Get down to verse 31. The son of Melea, the son of Mena, the son of David, the son of Jesse, or excuse me, Mena, the son of Matatha, the son of, what was the next name? Nathan. Nathan is Solomon's brother. Okay? So, Nathan, the son of David. So, David has royal blood. His royal blood went to Solomon, and through Solomon is where you get the, the legal right to have set, the kings. But he gets his, mother, his mother's lineage comes from Nathan, the brother of, of Solomon. Are you scratching your head? Yes. <laughs> he... He had to have royal blood. His mother, the seed, just says in Genesis, the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. Right? Mary was his real mother. He gets the blood right to be king of Israel through his mother because she was not connected to Jeconiah. Because Solomon was the line that led to Jeconiah. Nathan, the brother, the are we getting it? <laughs> See what I mean? That's just something. Okay, now, if you, if you do get it, the uh, first time I heard it, I'm not going to get it fully either, but think about this. God, if it were just men that wrote the Bible, if men said to themselves, you know what, I think I want to just devise a way to just deceive the human race. I want to mess them up, and I want to have them think that, that somebody's going to actually die on a cross, and... Uh, and we're going to just, we're going to concoct this thing. But, but we're not going to do it in one generation. I'm going to have David, I'm going to, I'm going to somehow figure out how David can write Psalm, uh, Psalm 
Psalm 22 and say the very words that Jesus spoke on the cross. And I'm going to have uh, Isaiah come along at 753 B.C., 250 years later, and I'm going to have him say a bunch of stuff. It's all going to be like prophecy pieces. And then I'm going to have this king, I'm going to have him burn out some scroll pieces. And I'm going to just do all this stuff over the course of 2,000 years. It's, it's all just going to, by accident, happen. Where it's so precise that, I mean, like, this is just precision detail. You follow what I'm saying? My point is, I'm not doing maybe the greatest job of explaining it, but God had to have written this book. Men penned it, but he moved men to write exactly what he wanted written. So that you and I can say, man, uh, I, don't, I don't have to, I don't care what science says about creation. I really don't. Because I've got the Bible that is just so complex and so true that I know, God, I can believe, I can trust God. I can trust the fact that when he says that he created the earth in six days, and he says in the evening and the morning of the first day, in the evening and the morning of the second day, I believe that. Not because I'm a geologist, but because I believe the Bible. And the more I study the Bible, the more I realize, man, this is no joke, guys. People didn't, people couldn't have put this thing together. It's impossible. This is God's word. Okay? And he calls and takes the, the worst, the, 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 the biggest hater of Christianity becomes the biggest proponent of Christianity. Uh, John, I think you said it once. Uh, Dave, uh, John, Dave, you said it. One of the biggest things for me, as far as Christianity is, explain the change in the Apostle Paul. It's huge. It is huge. All right. Any question? Uh, I was just thinking yeah. how uh, how critical it was when you just said that it had to be Joseph and Mary, and how close Joseph came to quietly leaving her, but God showed up in a dream and said, "No, it had to be him and her, you know, yeah. to make that all work." You know, make that all work. It, it's just uh, again, I, I, I covered a lot of territory that might be confusing, but if you Spend some time thinking about that. Figuring, man, this is a complex, like, 2,000 word, 2,000 piece puzzle that dropped out of the sky, and when it lands, it, it all fits. It, it's amazing. It's a reliable word. That's right. I was just saying, for clarification purposes, we know that Joseph was Jesus' earthly father, but the reason why he didn't come from Joseph's bloodline was because he was virgin, conceived, by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. Just for, in case people are not aware of that. Exactly. Yeah. And, I, and I always thought it was just so he wouldn't have a sin nature inherited from Adam. Because we get our, you know, when Adam sinned, it was passed on all of us. Romans 5 tells us. When Adam sinned, we all, we all fell in Adam. We all have a sin nature. But because he doesn't have a human father, he didn't get that. Uh, that's one reason. But the other reason is because of this, this whole curse thing. It's like, just another, and again, that's just like a little gem, a little sidetrack. God kind of thought of all the details. You know. He kind of thought of all the details. I better believe it. I love it. it, is, it to me, it's faith building. When you pick out a nugget like that, it's like, wow. Uh, so anyway, okay, so we'll go back to the Apostle Paul back in Romans. some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be uninformed or unaware or ignorant, brethren, 
that oftentimes I've been, I intended to come to you, but thus far I have been prevented. All right, now let's get real about some practical application. Anybody here have a bucket list? Anything you want to do? Anyone here want to see the Grand Canyon before they die that hasn't seen it yet? Sure. No? <laughs> you would? Don't be afraid to raise your hand. There's no pictures being taken. <laughs> Anybody got a bucket list, something you really want to do? Yeah, that you haven't done yet? Johnny? Yeah, when I retire, I'm going to travel around in the fifth wheel and hang out wherever I want to hang out. <laughs> Wyoming's one of the places, right? I don't She'll see me. When she <laughs> what was that? I missed that. She'll see me whenever she gets a chance to see me. Woohoo! <laughs> 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 What's that? Ride a bicycle through Scotland. Ride a bicycle through Scotland. Wow, that's cool. Pedaling your wares. No. no. Did you get that? No. <laughs> Anybody? Uh, you get the point, though. A bucket list. One, one of the things um, Paul really wanted to do was get to Rome. And I'll bet you many, many times. He's, what, do you, what do you know about Rome? One language? Greek. It's a, it's a world language. The then known world was speaking Greek as a language. The, the road system. If I, Paul's probably thinking, man, if I got to Rome and could convert people in Rome and get and this thing and Christianity to take off. So God, why won't you let me get to Rome? If he'd made it to Rome, what wouldn't we have today? The Vatican. Hmm? <laughs> the Vatican. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't even say that out loud. That was my inside point. <laughs> if he made it to Rome when at, on his timetable, we would have had a little epistle to the Romans about a few issues. Okay? Well, what do we have? Jesus. The greatest treatise on salvation. We have the book of Romans because he couldn't make it to Rome. All to mean, what's that mean to you and me? Maybe there's things you wish you could do, or things you wish you had, or things that have happened to you, and you say, why, God? But God's ways are higher than our ways, Isaiah 55. Amen. And his, his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And His Word does not return void, it accomplishes what He wants it to accomplish. The stuff going on in your life that you call horrible things are ordained by God. God is a sovereign God and a holy God, and He is in charge of what's going on in your life today. He is. I love my, uh, Mr. Thomas, my theology professor, is dead now. He said, my friends, he says, the wiggle of every snowflake is under the authority of God. You know, <laughs> that's the way he, these guys are incredible. Newscaster Paul Harvey told a remarkable story of God's providential care of the thousands of Allied prisoners during World War II. Remember Paul Harvey? Oh, yeah. Good news. Good day. Many of whom are Christians. One of America's mighty bombers took off on the island of Guam headed for Kokura, Japan with a deadly cargo. Because clouds covered the target area, the sleek V-29 circled for nearly an hour until its fuel supply reached the danger point. The captain and his crew, frustrated because they were right over the primary target, were not able to fulfill their mission. But they finally decided they would better go for the secondary target. Changing course, they found that the sky was clear and the command was given bombs away and the B-29 headed for its home base. Some time later, an officer received some startling information from military intelligence. Just one week before that bombing mission, the Japanese had transferred one of their largest concentrations of captured Americans to the city of Kokuro. Upon reading this, the officer exclaimed, thank God for that protecting cloud. If the city hadn't been hidden from the bomber, it would have been destroyed and thousands of American boys would have died. And this guy, John Nelson Darby, says, God's ways are behind the scenes, but he moves all the scenes which he is behind. We have to learn this and let him work. Is God at work? Sometimes we don't think so, right? Why aren't you listening, God? Why aren't you doing what I want to do? Because God's doing what he wants to do. Pretty cool stuff.
One of the problems in the world is polluted water. Okay? So ask yourselves, is the Christian's main job to clean, and, and let's call the world the fishbowl. Alright? And the fishbowl is pretty polluted. Is the Christian's main job to clean that fishbowl or the fish in that fishbowl? Any unsaved person can help clean that fishbowl. But only those of us that have the gospel can fish in that fishbowl, right? I thought of another way of presenting that. It isn't just fish in that fishbowl, but you've got a, another whole fishbowl full of clean water. And you can scoop that fish out of that nasty water and plop it into that clean water. Isn't that cool? He did that to me 41 years ago. And you jumped out of that. And how are you doing at fishing? Paul said he was separated under the gospel. His life was changed and he just, his focus was changed to the souls of men. And I think he wants us to, we're not ever going to be the Apostle Paul, but you are, you are going to be who you are. And you can, you can speak to the gospel. We got time for one more story. A conversation I heard just this week with a pastor friend of mine. The youth group was was learning the Romans role. They were memorizing the verses. For all have sinned to control the glory of God. Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23. Uh, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. They were all memorizing this. And one of the kids in the youth group said, I think with us, a lot of people are just stop saying anything because they, they don't know enough. They aren't smart enough. And they're doing damage to the gospel by just speaking a bunch of foolishness to people. And this is a young girl with her opinion that people that didn't really know how to defend the faith were doing more harm than good if they tried to defend the faith. What do you think about that? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. The Apostle Paul here in verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. It is the power. What's, what's the power? The gospel is the power of God. It's, it's the scriptures. My sister didn't know much Bible at all, but we knew she got religion. And we were up there to try to talk her out of it. For about six months, we kept meeting with her and, and playing cards and saying, Lynn, go down to the Cobra Couch and have a beer or something and loosen up a little bit. You've gone crazy with this religion stuff. And all she did was say, well, Romans says this, and Titus says that, and Genesis says this, and pretty quick, we're in church. Little did we know the Holy Spirit was dragging us, kicking and screaming, to the foot of the cross. Because she just used the scripture. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exalt with all long-suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But they will heap to themselves teachers that will go on and tickle their ears. But you just shepherd people. Share the gospel. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the gospel that Paul talked about. Thank you that you took a man that was just an absolute enemy of the gospel and turned him around and made him the, the driving force in the first century to spread the gospel throughout the then known world. But also, you didn't always answer his prayers his way. In the same way you don't answer ours sometimes. We go through stuff and we say, why? But we can look back later on and say, you did it all well. You know what you're doing. You're in control. As much pain as we're in sometimes through different situations and circumstances, all things work together for good to them that love God. Romans 8, 28. It's still in the book and it's true. Thank you for your word. I pray you can help us to encourage each other through fellowship here and and go out and try to live the, the life in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.